Okay, for section uh, 4 7, we're going to look at some new functions that are related to the current functions that we're studying, which are, of course, the trigonometric functions. And we're going to start out by looking at what we call the inverse sine function. Now, just a reminder, we have some experience with inverses from our work in the past. We know that, for instance, if we have an equation like y equals 3x plus 6, which is a linear function, okay, one of the things that we know about inverses is that in order to have an inverse that's a function, that the function has to be 1 to 1. So, with that said, if I were to graph 3x plus 6 on our coordinate plane, Remember, 1 to 1 means that it has to pass the horizontal line test. Okay. So remember, it has to pass the vertical line test in order to be a function. In order to, have, in order to be a 1 to 1 function, it has to pass the horizontal line test, which this one, of course, does both. Okay. And so remember, what inverses do <coughs> is they essentially undo each other. Okay. So if I knew the inverse of this function, if I were to plug an x into this and get a y out, and I take the y and put it into the inverse, I'd get back to the same x that I started with. Okay. So I'm making an x-y chart for this. I, of course, know that this goes through 0, 6, okay. goes through negative 1, uh, positive 3, that is, and then it goes through 1, 9, if you will. Okay. The inverse function of this, if this is our, what we call f of x, then our f inverse function, remember, would have the x-y chart that would be 6, 0, 3, negative 1, 9, 1. Okay. And if we were to plot those points, Go ahead and do that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 0, 3, negative 1, and then uh, 9, 1. And we draw this, and again, this is going to look better on graph paper because I'm not a very good artist, but ultimately we would have that. So remember, one of the geometric properties of functions that are inverses of each other is that they are symmetric over the line y equals x. So that's a geometric property of two functions that are inverses of each other. Okay. Uh, we also learned uh, in our previous work how to find the inverse of a function, if it's possible. And in the case of a linear function, it's always possible. The procedure, remember, is to replace the x and the y with one another, and then solve the equation for y. So we'd have x minus 6 equals 3y, x minus 6 divided by 3 equals y. And so our inverse function, then, in this case, would be one third x minus two, and ultimately that equation compared to this equation, okay, these two would undo each other. Remember, we also learned how to prove that that's true by composing them both ways. We could take the inverse function and plug it into the f function, and if we do that, we would get x as long as they're inverses. And then the other way, we take the f function, put it into the inverse, and we'd also get x. Okay, remember, that's the way that we proved these two functions were inverses of each other. Okay. So those are the techniques that we learned. And just to re-illustrate one more time, just to make sure we're clear. Okay. If I were to put a 6 in there, okay, if I put 6 in here, I'd get 1 third times 6, which is 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. Okay, if I were to put a 3 in there, I'd get 1 minus 2, which would be negative 1. 9 in here would give me 3 minus 2, which is 1. So it does, in fact, have that property that if I have a point on the function, x, y, the point on the inverse would be the reverse. It would be y, x, if you will. Okay. So those are some properties of inverses that we've studied in the past. And we're going to have those same types of properties when we talk about the inverse sine function. Now, there's one problem with the inverse sine function, and it's the same problem with all of our trig functions, is that if we were to graph the entire sine function, okay, would it have that one-to-one -one property? Would this pass the horizontal line test if I were to draw a horizontal line? Definitely not. It would fail it miserably, wouldn't it? Okay. So, therefore, what we've done here as mathematicians, and this really wasn't my choice because I'm too young, but <clears throat> we've decided to restrict the domain of the sine function to just between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, because if we just took that portion only, okay, then would it be 1 to 1? Yeah, okay, it would be. And then if we do that, then we can talk about this thing having an inverse function, as long as we're talking about just between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay? So, if it does have an inverse, okay, we should expect that it, the inverse have points that are going to be, again, reversed of these points that we see here. And if we look at some of the key points here, we have negative pi over 2, negative 1. We have pi over 2, 1. We have 0, 0. Okay? We know, just because of our experience, that we also have pi over 4, radical 2 over 2. 
true. And we have negative pi over 4, negative radical 2 over 2. We put the y coordinates there. Okay. And so if we were to reverse those points and plot them on a coordinate plane, we would get the inverse function. And as it turns out, it looks like that. And if we were to plot those points that I mentioned, uh, negative pi over 2, negative 1, I would plot negative 1, negative pi over 2. Here it is right here. Fair enough. Okay. If I were to plot pi over 2, 1 on this one, I'd plot 1 pi over 2 on this one, and there we go. 0, 0 reversed, of course, is just 0, 0. And if I plot enough points in between, I'm going to get this general shape. Okay, so you notice that it doesn't look too dissimilar from the original in this case. And if we were actually to take this and put it on top of this, we would see that they are, in fact, okay, <coughs> reflections of each other over the line y equals x, just like all inverses are. Okay. Now, another couple of things to note here is, uh, and this is another feature that we talked about in the past as well with inverses, is that in this particular case, the domain is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And the range is negative 1 to 1. True? So if we're just looking at that part only, and, and we know that the entire sine function, the range is actually negative infinity to infinity, or the domain, I should say. But in this case, the domain is going to be restricted to between those two. Which, what does that do for the range in the domain of our other function? Okay. The range, remember, becomes the domain. The domain becomes the range. So the range of the inverse sine function is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and the domain is negative 1 to 1, as we can see illustrated in the picture as well. We're going from negative to 1 to 1, to, or negative 1 to 1 in the x direction, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 in the y direction. Okay. And I'm going to put a circle around the range part here because this is the part that's probably going to be the most important to us when we're dealing with the inverse sine function, is what is the range of the inverse sine. Okay. And for us, the negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 is going to be very important for what what we're going to do in terms of problem solving. Now, uh, besides being a, a legitimate function itself for us to study, okay, we also use the inverse sine to do other things like solve equations. Okay? Um, so in Algebra 2 especially, okay, we use the inverse sine to solve equations and we're going to do that same thing here in this class as well. Okay? So that's why it's important for us to understand this function. Okay. All right. <clears throat> The uh, information that I just discussed is also in a nice uh, box in your book that looks like this. We're not going to take the time to write all that down. I do want to point out one other thing besides the, um, the term inverse sine. Okay, we also can say arc sine. So if you see arc sine, that means the same thing as inverse sine. Okay, when we write it in symbols, in math symbols, okay, we can either write sine inverse, so sine to the negative 1x, that means sine inverse. Okay, and then arc sine, that means exactly the same thing. Okay, so when we see those two things, we just need to recognize that <clears throat> those are the same as one another. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> what we're going to look at here is uh, how do we use that information then to figure out a question like what's the sine inverse of negative one half? Okay, so what is the sine inverse of negative one half? Now I'm going to show you what I like to do here with this type of problem. Okay, is I like to recognize that if I'm going to have a sine inverse of a value, okay, <clears throat> then my answer to this should be an angle. Because really this question would have come from this equation. When does the sine of theta equal negative one half? In other words, what angle okay, would give me negative one half okay, when I do the sine of it, if you will? Because what it boils down to is if I have to solve this equation, and we, we did this without actually thinking about the inverse sine in our last section. Okay, we actually handled the problem like that earlier today, didn't we? Okay, how do I figure out what angle gives me negative one half? Well, the answer is going to come from the unit circle, of course. Okay, but just to recognize that why this is the same as this, is because if we we're going to solve this equation, we would do sine inverse of both sides. Okay, that's how we get rid of sine. Okay, and we get theta over here, and then of course the answer would be sine inverse of negative one half. Now, let's go ahead and find an answer for this. If we look at our unit circle, and I need sine to be negative one half, okay, we know that's going to have to be in the third or fourth quadrants. Okay, that's going to have to be where the y coordinate is going to be small. So that would be for us. That would be this would be six pi over six. That'd be seven pi over six. 8 pi over 6, 9 pi over 6, 10 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6. So that would be one of those two answers 
is the right answer. True? Now, the issue that we have here when we answer this question, though, is that only one of those can be the right answer. Okay? So we got to decide which one is the right answer. And <clears throat> if we have them in this form, okay, the answer is actually neither are the right answer. Okay? And let's think about why. We talked about a minute ago the range of the inverse sine is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. That means when I do the inverse sine of some value, okay, the only valid answers here are going to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. They can't be 7 pi over 6 or 11 pi over 6 because those are not between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, are they? Okay, so those two are not legitimate answers. Okay, so here's what we're going to do then. If we, get, if we do our work like normal and we found the two positions, those are the right positions that we want, okay, but neither one of the positive angles work, then what we're going to do is we're going to write them as negative angles because they might work if they're negative angles. And so if I do it in the negative direction, I'd have negative pi over 6 and negative 5 pi over 6. And out of those two choices, out of the two negative choices, okay, do either one of those okay, live inside that range? Okay. Well, of course, we know that negative 5 over 6 does, so the answer in this case would be negative 5 over 6. Okay. And we could go from there. Now, just to uh, illustrate, okay, once again, the key issue is finding the two positions that are valid here. And with sine and cosine, there's always going to be two possible positions, right? Okay. If the normal positive numbers at those positions don't work, okay, do the negatives, go around the other way at those same positions. And one of those four had better work. Okay, if it doesn't, then there's something more wrong than we can probably handle. Okay. Now, I want to show you that you do have an inverse sine button, of course, on your calculator. So if you do inverse sine of negative 1 half, okay, notice it gives you negative 0.5, 2, 3, etc. Okay. Your calculator also understands the range of the inverse sine because notice what it gave you. It gave you negative pi over 6, didn't it? Okay. So again, when we're taking the inverse sine, the, what we're looking for is an angle. We're looking for what angle would give us a sine value of negative one half. <laughs> now, as long as the value here is one of our nice values, like one half or radical two over two or radical three over two, okay, with sine, cosine, okay, or if it's tangent, radical three over three, negative radical three over three, or radical three, uh, one, etc., our nice values, then we can find the answer with a unit circle. Okay, if we had some other number in here that was not a nice number, then we would have no choice but to the calculator answer for it. Okay. All right. Questions so far? All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, <clears throat> this problem then next. Okay. We want the sine inverse of the sine of pi over 10. Okay, so sine inverse of the sine of pi over 10. And what we want to do is work from the inside out here. Okay, recognizing, however, though, that the sine of pi over 10, that's not going to be a nice answer for us, and it says without a calculator. Okay, pi over 10 is not one of our nice angles, is it? Okay, so what we want to recognize here is that, like I talked to you a minute ago in the equation that we solved, is what do sine inverse and sine do to each other? Okay, they undo each other. So as long as this answer, as long as the argument is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, then isn't that the answer then? True? Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and uh, generalize that here a second, and then we'll come back to another one in a minute. Uh, let's see. Find my right page. Here we are. Okay, this is our generalization, and this is also another nice uh, box in your book that you can uh, refer to if you need to. Okay. <clears throat> when we compose sine and sine inverse, or cosine and cosine inverse, tangent, tangent inverse, okay, when we compose them, and keep in mind that composition, remember, is different if it's one direction or the other. So we're putting the inverses into the functions. Okay. We always get the argument. Okay, always, no matter what. So if I told you right now, what's the cosine of the cosine inverse of radical 3 over 2? You would say it's radical 3 over 2. Done. Okay. Now, 
when we do it the other way though, when we have the tangent inverse or the cosine inverse or the sine inverse on the outside, okay, these sentences, okay, it's only the argument, they only cancel each other out directly and give us the argument if, okay, that x is in the restricted domains of the sine, cosine, and tangent. Okay, in other words, <clears throat> the answer has to be in the range of the inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent. In the previous one we did, pi over 10 was in the range, therefore the answer was simply pi over 10. Okay? If that x is not in the range, okay, then we're going to have to make an adjustment. Okay? And we're going to see that here in just a minute. Okay? So in general, as long as the inverse is the inside one, okay, the answer is always just simply x, okay, whatever that argument is. Okay? And if, this, if the sine is on the inside and the inverse is on the outside, okay, then the answer is x as long as the x is in the range of the inverse function that you're dealing with. Okay, if it's not, then we have to make an adjustment.